Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mind Your Own Revisions. And after a long time, after a whole year, in fact, I have another guest on the podcast, uh, Dr. Nicole uh, Jans. I hope I pronounced it correctly, right? And uh, thank you so much, Nicole, for coming on to Mind Your Own Revisions to share your experiences um, around mental health and burnout in academia as an ex-academic, if I may say, or a recovering academic. Mm -hmm. um, so before we start, I would like to introduce Nicole very shortly. She had been an academic in her previous life, and she also worked as a journalist. And after her burnout experience, she also got some clarity and she um, found her purpose again and became a writing coach, working both with academics and entrepreneurs who are writing nonfiction so that she could help these people uh, produce that, that product, that, that book that are in them. And without further ado, let's start. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you. Welcome and thank you for having me. Sure. Thank you for coming in and uh, being willing to share your experience because as uh, you also know very well, it's not very easy to talk about these things. Uh, maybe it is getting a bit easier now, but still there's a lot of stigma around it about the experience of burnout and um how to say there's also this shame around it and all uh but yeah we will come to that I would like to ask you first about your academic career like what were you doing and uh yeah who was the previous Nicole well the previous Nicole um stumbled into academia sort of by accident um I was a journalist and wanted to follow my then partner um into um yeah into a new life uh, in Cambridge, and I couldn't find a job as a journalist. So what I did was just in case I don't find anything else, I applied for a PhD um, at Cambridge and thinking, you know, I could write a book, take some time and then see what unfolds. And indeed, I didn't stay, you know, a journalist. I got an offer and a scholarship. And so I jumped right in thinking I would just stay for three, four years, write a book and then become, you know, be a journalist again. And I ended up, um, yeah, I ended up becoming an academic learning statistics. I was a political scientist um, doing statistical analysis looking at the impact on of human rights, uh, sorry, the impact of foreign direct investment by big companies on human rights in developing nations. And so I ended up doing the PhD much longer than I thought, did a postdoc, became a lecturer um, until I then later, you know, left the field again. But I was an academic for 10 whole years. Wow, that's a, that's a long time. And you came quite far for, for a person who accidentally <laughs> stumbled upon <laughs> this academic career. But there was certainly something in you because you went through the trouble of learning statistics. That's not the easiest. Yeah, absolutely. I tend to be, um, I can be a little bit obsessive. So when there is something that I find difficult and I need to sort of, I need to dig deeper I think that's a good thing to have in academia, right? Wanting to go really deep, being a little bit relentless, being ambitious. So I did not think I would end up being, you know, doing statistical analyses. And I don't think I'm I'm very talented for it either. I just really wanted to prove myself that I can do it. And it's sort of, that was the research gap that I saw as a PhD student. Um, I will say that it's probably not my zone of genius, um, which I figured out much later, you know, um, but you know, in, in the moment, it just felt good to learn something and to prove to myself I can do it. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And when you describe yourself as, you know, ambitious, a bit uh, detail-oriented, wanting to go deeper into something, wanting to prove yourself and all, that's a very familiar description of a, like a, regular typical academic right mm -hmm. what do you what do you think about that do, do you agree yeah I mean most people that 
were my colleagues um, and now the academics that I'm coaching, they tend to be people who are curious and um, I mean, it's weird to say that, but intelligent, ambitious, and, uh, you know, have a real passion for the topic um, and often passion for the teaching, which comes on a little bit later. And um, yeah, I think it would be very hard to be an academic and not put your heart and soul in it. Um, I think there is, you know, you can easily tip over into overworking. We can talk about that in a second, but sort of the willingness to give you all and to make this your life. Um, I think that I, I've seen that a lot and it certainly took over my life. I turned from journalist and writer Nicole, who was just trying this out, into like full blown, I want to become a professor. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And that that idealism too, like changing the world is a is a big motivation for us as well mm -hmm. but that's not the only way you can do that right now now that yeah. you have come out and have uh, being this writing coach helping people in another way mm. there are certainly other ways uh to exercise that and then maybe this is a right time to start talking about your burnout experience mm -hmm. a bit and what got you there, first of all, like how you recognize the signs, second of all, and how you got out of it. I'll start with how I recognized it, because I think I had burnout much longer than I knew. Um, and the way I recognized it, I was um, I was going to a writing retreat in Scotland um, to just get some writing done because I, you know, had a lot of unfinished projects, didn't know what to do. And I went to that retreat, an academic structured writing retreat by Rowena Murray, uh, who is well known in the UK. And I went there and th me and a lot of other women, they are mostly women going to these things. Um, we talked about the writing, but even more, we talked about feeling exhausted, commuting, children, feeling, you know, sometimes you are not valued um, in, in the job, either by students or by your boss or by the payment that you receive. Um, and we talked a lot about overworking. And I remember exactly at this one writing retreat in January, um, two, two, three years ago, I felt like, wow, I, it really resonated with me what these other women said. And there was one in particular who was, you know, further in her career. And she said, Nicole, you need to watch out for burnout. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I sort of brushed it off and went about my thing. And on the way home, my body started talking to me in a very unpleasant way. So on the way home, on the subway in, in Glasgow, the tube, um, I felt very panicky. And I felt it was too hot and my heart was racing. And I went out, you know, took a taxi instead, got to the train station and on the train, which down to Cambridge is about five ish hours on the train. I had basically what I would now describe as like a five hour long panic attack where I just, I didn't want to be on the train. I didn't want to go back to my life. I would have gone back to campus and start preparing my teaching the next day. Um, and I just didn't want to be there. And I had a heart racing, uh, my heart racing. I had, um, I was very sweaty and I was feeling, I hope no one sees me. Like I hope no one sees what's going on. So I felt very alone and, you know, so really weird, uncomfortable symptoms. And I, what I did have, I had a little Lego duck. So on the writing retreat, there was someone there who get, who handed out Lego ducks to, with like five little bricks. How can you build a duck in 10 different ways? So I was sitting there playing with that Lego, holding on to just, I'm going to make it home. I'm going to make it home. I'm going to make it home. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was meant to go to work the next day on a commute. Again, I lived in between, um, you know, Scotland. I, I lived in Cambridge, commuted to Nottingham at that time, which is where my campus was at the time. And I just could not bring myself to go. I just could not get on the train. I could not physically, my everything in my body was saying, you cannot go there. It's unsafe. Um, it's danger zone. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the first time I realized, okay, something is really wrong here. Um, and I went to my GP and cried and felt ashamed. And we didn't really know what was going on. So we said, okay, 
let's give you a week, you know, sign you off sick and just reconsider in a week and just like get a grip on what's going on. So this was the first time I had this idea, maybe there might be something not quite right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is um, indeed such a dramatic experience. And many of us, unfortunately, go through such an experience to finally comprehend that something is going on. And how was the diagnosis process like were you diagnosed with burnout like did, did the doctors knew about know about that that concept what did they tell you at the end so we figured out together that I probably had panic attacks which was the case right and uh, very high anxiety and by talking through things with the doctor it appeared that I also was extremely disillusioned about my job um, very, you know, resistant to the commute that I had. I also had little, little children. Um, I just, everything in me was very negative about the job. I didn't really feel like I'm making a difference. Um, I actually, and I mean, I noticed during that time, I actually found it really hard to open emails from work. So when I logged into my work email, which I deleted from my phone, I got this sense of real stress, um, especially when I saw an email from my boss at the time who maybe needed something from me or was unhappy with how I did something. So we talked through that and I realized I don't really, I don't think I can go to work. I don't want to go and I don't see the point of going. Um, so on top of the panic attacks where my body just st said, stop, you're not safe. Um Everything else pointed in the direction that I may have burnout. And I don't know if the doctor said it or if I Googled it, <laughs> you know, as a researcher, you will go online and check out what's going on, academic anxiety and things like that. Um, but yeah, it. I mean, it turned into a four month stay at home because I was just really incapable. I was at times incapable of actually leaving the house. Um and, you know, the GP said, oh, well, you can get medication, but I didn't want that. And um, yeah, so it took me a while to fully embrace that this is burnout because I thought burnout is just, you know, overworking and then being exhausted. But I had this, these, all these other symptoms of being quite low mood, having a low mood, anxiety, complete disillusionment, not really seeing the point not really wanting to write any of my papers anymore, not caring about the students and my courses. I just cared about nothing. And I didn't understand that these are all actually signs of burnout. At the time, I was just, okay, apparently I'm not made out for this job. Something is wrong with me. Um, but yeah, it took a while to really let it sink in and to understand fully what is going on. Yeah, that's that's true. And And did you have uh other symptoms around like cognitive issues like the some people have issues with memory loss with inability to focus and all kinds of things and some of us have these emotional problems where we, we can't control our emotions anymore or the, the smallest thing becomes the hot worst thing that ever happened to you these mm. kind of things because you talk really a lot about that disillusionment and um, the mental distance from work which used to be called um cynicism mm -hmm. but then they they changed the the discourse around it because it's more than cynicism it's like it, it includes any kind of distance from work and thoughts of yeah this doesn't mean anything to anybody anyway and uh yeah how about the, the other other areas? Yeah. So I definitely found myself very irritable, especially with, you know, the children who wanted stuff from me and I just had no capacity, which gave me massive guilt, of course. Um, I sometimes would cry for no particular reason. I mean, yes, I was on sick leave and sort of sorting out my life, but, you know, I would do something and in the middle of it just start crying for when I felt, well, everything is current right now, it's sort of, you know, contained and okay. Um, 
I didn't have brain fog so much, but I noticed that I was on sort of still, even though I was on sick leave, I was on still like a very high adrenaline level. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, now I can read a novel and just calm down. But something inside of me, like I could feel it in my chest. I can feel it now as I'm telling you that I had this tension and it took me actually a really long time to stop thinking, oh, I should do this. I should do that. I should read a novel. I should, should reach a research burnout. Um, these things I couldn't do, like I couldn't focus. I was quite restless and, you know, sleep wasn't really great either. Um, so I kept waking up at night with all kinds of racing thoughts about letting my students down and what are my colleagues going to think, but also am I going to be able to function as a mother? So these sort of things, um, you know, a bit of headaches, that, that, so there was, there was something there. Um, which, you know, it's, un it's very unpleasant, especially if you feel like, oh, I'm not in control of my emotions. Um, so yeah, I had those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, who helped you? Did you get uh, the, the help and support that you needed at the, at the time, especially from professionals who could have helped you? Well, it did help to speak to the GP. Um, I found myself going there a few times and basically just crying, <laughs> um, um, which um, it was a form of release. I mean, but a GP is obviously um, not a psychologist. So in the UK, there are long waiting lists. So I ended up getting my own psychologist that I paid for um, to talk to. And that was extremely helpful just to dig deeper into more than just the work troubles um so that was helpful and the other thing that really helped was finding myself something to do so it sounds a bit odd because i thought as a when you have burnout you should stop doing anything and just relax but i couldn't really relax so i had a conversation with my mom and uh, she's a very practical german um and sort of very like you know get something done and so I wasn't really sure what to do and I said you know honestly I don't know which what how to be and she said well maybe find yourself a small project anything um, just to have something to do some motions some actions just it doesn't even matter what and then what I did I signed up for a creative writing course an online course because at the same time the pandemic hit so there was nothing really where you could go um, and I signed up for a six week a course um, at the Cambridge University on writing a short story um, just to have something to do. And that triggered like it opened a box of joy and reclaiming my joy in writing and sort of learning what creativity can really mean when you're not just constantly under pressure to publish your academic articles. Um, and I remember exactly what I wrote in the online forum and it said, oh, you know, introduce yourself. I said, I'm Nicole, I'm burnt out um, and I want to reclaim writing for myself and make it joyful again. And that led to a series of more creative writing courses. I'm, you know, an undergraduate certificate, a diploma, and, you know, now I'm doing a master's. Um, and I finally had, so I had something to hold on to when everything was sort of breaking apart so for me that was creativity and finding a new entrance into writing and allowing myself that joy and sort of just the uncertainty around that and the vulnerability the exploring of my emotions um and yeah you can see me smiling and that was just really that was beautiful and that that's actually one of the biggest things that helped me see some hope to be honest yeah just some hope yeah well, your mom is a very wise woman mm -hmm. because that, that's that's true. Actually, the the, the general idea uh, is to yeah, I'm burnt out. I should stop everything. That's not the best route to take, apparently, uh, according to more recent research and more anecdotal experience we have as like burnout coaches. Activation as soon as possible is very important in this case, but not going completely back into the, the stress situation, but really doing something, anything, 
any kind of activation instead of like lying on the couch for months waiting for the burnout to go away because that doesn't happen that way mm -hmm. and what you said is very inspiring and demonstrates this difference between doing something writing in your case that that comes from shoulds and have tos and yeah this is my job i need to write i need to publish taking the same activity and doing it with a completely different mindset with a completely different outcome with a completely different effect on you that, that yeah that's uh 180 degree difference right so it's it's very inspiring to hear that and it's very important for the listeners to to see that difference as well burnout doesn't mean that we have to like leave everything that we have been doing until that moment and like run away and then get a completely different life you just need to yeah make that shift but how that's the tricky one yeah yeah that shift happened through the doing so I mean now I understand that I needed to reframe my perception of reality and you know work on my mindset and all these now as a coach right I understand the concepts behind that but at that time I just needed to write and you know as a former journalist and then academic writing was at the core of everything that I absolutely loved and it I felt like almost it had been taken away from me by as you said the shoulds and the must and publish more and write more papers and I sort of really needed to reclaim that like that was basically my first love even as a child writing my journal and my diary with my little stories and I needed to not just think about writing or read a book about writing I needed to take that course where someone said here's your prompt no matter how good or bad just take pen and paper and write and sort of the mindset shift happen through the actual doing with you know obviously there was a community around it which really helped there were other writers everyone was frustrated in the pandemic needed something to do um but yeah it's I only in hindsight I understand why that works really well at the time I really just trusted my mom and booked myself a course <laughs> that's so great and uh, I'm wondering then how how did you come to the point where you decided to become a writing coach and to leave the academic career behind like how did that shift happen yeah of shifts well I wish that was like a happy story that I figured out what I really want to do in my life and said goodbye to academia happily and empowered but really what happened was I still I understood that creativity is really important and I need to do life in a different way but also had the pressure of I did have a tenure job and I didn't want to leave the club of being an academic and I didn't know what else I was going to do. So I went back um, and did another semester and it was different because it was online teaching during the pandemic. But, you know, I just, I relapsed right back into burnout because I was suddenly again in the same environment with the same need to prove myself to be very honest with the need to show to all my colleagues I can come back from my illness and show that I'm still made for academia and I went right back into burnout and I could see like after a few weeks of you know doing my teaching and trying to work on my research I just had the same symptoms and this time I saw it much earlier right um, every time an email came into my inbox I got really stressed and all these things I said earlier and the anxiety level went up. So this time, at least I knew what's going on. And um, well, I had, you know, some conversations with occupational health with my boss, thinking about should I go part time, but I didn't really, I, I felt like it's, I'm just going to be getting less money and still being in the same environment and mindset and wanting to prove myself and finishing my papers. So I felt like, for me personally, for other people, it works and I've seen it work, but for me, that didn't work. Um, and what I did, I put my feelers out, like I would run free writing retreats during the pandemic online with other writers, just so I can get to write and enjoy the writing, but also for them to have a place to go and write together um, and sort of 
in these writing retreats, I mean, I call it retreat. It was really just logging on Zoom, setting a goal, and then having breaks together. Um, I realized that during the breaks, people would often say, Nicole, I have a question. And then they would say, actually, I'm really stuck with this one thing, or, you know, I'm getting really stressed when I open this document. And so I noticed that it wasn't actually the the writing support that I gave and obviously received myself in that moment, but it was the conversations and the breaks, similar to the writing retreat that I went to before I had my big burnout and anxiety episode. I realized what happened during the breaks was much more connecting and insightful. And I saw that I actually helped them. I helped other writers to then after the break, start writing again. So I, for the first time, I thought, maybe coaching around writing could be something for me. And then, you know, it took quite a while to finally quit the job, um, write that message. I remember exactly how I typed, dear such and such, um, I'm writing today to, you know, hand in my notice and da da da. And I cried, I was typing and crying at the same time, but it was crying out of relief of finally like being honest to myself. Um, and yeah, so I took a little while and I did have coaching, um, as well. So I did have a coach and I mean, honestly, I came into the coaching session and I, and I said, I think I want to quit academia, but I can't bring myself to do it. And I, so I came into that coaching, blurting out what I probably needed to hear. And then within a few sessions, it was very clear that deep, deep down my deepest inner wisdom, like my very deepest core, everything in my body's and mind said this place is not working for you anymore and so yeah that's how step by step it came to be that I'm you know now doing what I love um, and I'm I feel like I'm ex in exactly the right place but it wasn't this light bulb moment it did take me a while um, and it was very scary too I will say yeah yeah that's another misconception people have right ah oh, that these things happen oh, in, a, in a moment the flash oh yeah now I know what I have to do with my life doesn't mm. happen that way especially when you have that kind of baggage that led you to burnout mm. nothing happens like that anymore and uh, well one question I, I have about you leaving academia because this is something I have experienced myself grief grief mm. for what I'm leaving behind grief for having worked and struggled for something that yeah took away my help um and and here I am leaving behind all the things I worked for like did you have this kind of grief uh, as well and uh, if so how long did it take you to leave that behind yeah that really resonates um because in many jobs, including when you're an academic, for, at least for me, it became my whole personality, right? I used to be a journalist for 10 years, and then I dedicated my whole life. Because if I do something, I do it with my everything. And I had this persona or identity as assistant professor. I was tenured. All, most of my friends were academics. It just sort of happens that way. This is how you also socialize, right? And suddenly I was. I was just losing, like, who is Nicole anymore, right? And that took me a long time because I've sort of, I knew what was leaving. I didn't quite know what I was stepping into. Um, and of course, then you see your colleagues less. And I, a lot of people who I thought were friends, they just, I wasn't on their radar anymore because you don't go to the same conferences and things like that. So I've, I have a few very good friends still, and we still talk. But most of like basically my whole social and work environment sort of slipped away from me, including my own identity. Who am I? What am I worth? How do I function? What do I, what value do I give to the world if it's not my research anymore? Um, I think my one step that helped me forward was um, I was in a coaching program and we thought a lot about the future self. So I imagined my future self, an older Nicole, you know, 20 years from now with long gray hair and just at peace with herself and sort of feeling centered and in 
you know, in alignment with herself. And I imagined her sitting next to me or coming into the room with me. And the first thing she did, she would give me like a big hug just to acknowledge that it's hard. Um, so, and then I would just sometimes, you know, talk to her in my head and envision that and ask her, what do you think I should do? What's my next step? And sometimes there would be nothing. And sometimes I heard a word, like I heard writer. You're just, you're a writer, um, which is true, right? And so by having something to look forward to, I didn't know exactly how my future self would look like and what exactly job or whatever she would be doing. But just there was that idea of, I can become something else. I can center myself again. And writer was the first thing that came to mind. And I mean, I am a writer. I'm writing a lot. Um, but yeah, and that helped me to overcome the grief. Sort of I needed to bit by bit, step by step, let go of the past and let go of all the, the story I had about myself wanting to become a full professor at an amazing university and, you know, making an impact with my research and changing the world in, in the human rights field. So I had to like step by step acknowledge that this is not, I, you know, I needed to sort of let it go, or at least I still care about human rights. I'm engaged in, you know, reading everything, but I needed to let go of in that box of academia, this is where my identity lies. And I needed something to look forward to, like I needed a rope to the future. And I just like, in the hard times when I felt everything is awful, my whole life's falling apart. I like I held on to that rope and envisioned my future self, a compassionate, wiser version of myself who knows it's hard right now, but also she knows there's a way out. Just like take one tiny step after the other and you can move forward. So this is sort of how I, it's a sort of, yeah, it's it's a coaching tool that, I just learned by be, being coached, right? But it, that really, really helped me. And I still have sometimes grief. You know, I coach a lot of academics. I coached at the university where I did a PhD, which is Cambridge. So I'm running my coaching program in-house for them. And I, I'm actually working with former colleagues who book me for things. And I'm always getting a little bit of, ah, maybe I could have made it. And then I think like, no you you couldn't and you wouldn't it wouldn't have been what you really want to do but yeah up, once in a while it comes up because you know I I live in Cambridge which is full of academics and you're not gonna you're not gonna escape and you know shut the door completely so it's still something to deal with yeah yeah certainly but uh it's a beautiful story indeed mm. you deciding to follow that wisdom that was already there so that's this is actually the, what what people call the the, the um, post-traumatic growth eh? post burnout growth as well mm -hmm. that's the it will sound very weird when I say it like that but beauty of having gone through burnout because certain realizations you only come to after that kind of experience that shakes you to the core and makes you confront mm -hmm. with everything and everything that you have strived for in your life. And you go like, was it worth it? Do I still yeah. want to keep doing this? Yeah. I, I'm having a hard time to thank anxiety attacks, but yeah. I will say that with this crisis, I managed to see what else is out there for me and to like step more into what I really mostly want to spend my time with, which is connection with others and being creative. And in academia, the way it is now, it would have never been possible. I think if I hadn't had the commute or maybe if, you know, if, if, if there might have been a way to continue if I hadn't had children, for example, right? Or, you know, all of these things. But I would have never fully understood what it means to, to feel empowered and in control. At least for me, it wasn't possible. I know that now there's a lot of academic coaching that can help with that and stay, but that is not my path. And I think without the big breakdown and my body just shutting me down, like a panic attack is you think you're dying. And um, 
I've had not just one, I had many, many of those. And it, this is just completely paralyzing. And if I hadn't had that, so I will thank my body. I do that, right? If I hadn't had that, I would not have been able to see like to open new doors and sort of become a little bit closer to what I actually want, because I would have just stayed on the hamster wheel, you know, constantly proving myself, writing, writing, because when you're in it, you don't see how, how bad it is for you, or at least it was for me, right? You know, it may not have been for everyone. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, this is what I tell myself and I still sometimes slip into burnout territory as a business owner now and coach, I keep telling myself, watch out for the signs. And I, my main question is, what can I create from this? So I'm trying to see, uh-oh, I'm slipping into crisis mode. What is my body telling me? And what can I sort of moving forward? What can I learn? So this is like a big thing that I do now, instead of being upset with myself and putting myself down, oh, again, you are, you know, ugh, you're not managing that those thoughts do come up by the way, but sort of, I then try to shift it into, okay, so what is really happening here? Um, what am I getting? What, what do I get to learn right now? And that's a much more productive question. Um, yeah. So, and I'm sure there will be more crises coming my way. Uh, that is just how life is. Um, but how I deal with them, I think has changed now. I think there's something very fundamental about how I conduct myself throughout difficult times that has definitely changed after it yeah yeah and um, how do you feel right now now that you're a writing coach and you run your own business and how does that make you feel in your day-to-day -day work life mm. so interestingly I'm still doing a lot of things that I used to do in academia which is mentoring sort of helping others on their way, some teaching, a lot of writing, um, but sort of on my terms. And that is the big shift. Um, I'm still very interested in research. I'm still writing a lot, but sort of I pick who I work with, of course, because as a coach, you can decide if you make a coaching offer or not. Um, and I see, I often, uh, other than academia, I see the immediate impact because when I am coaching another writer and they come into the session feeling really run down and completely blocked and they leave with a glimmer of hope, sometimes a smile, one action step, there is like such an immediate gratification, right? And including the human connection. This is not, I'm not in the world of comparing myself all the time. <laughs> Um, and trying to be better than the other writer next to me, but helping them empower themselves. So it feels very different. I feel in control of my time. I feel in control of my creativity. Um, I pick who I work with. I build human connections, which is really important to me. Um, so that the, this is the amazing side of it. I will say um, that being still somewhat the same person, wanting to prove myself, being ambitious, wanting to show that I can have a great business and help even more people. I sometimes step right back into that hamster wheel into the old thinking. And so, I mean, now I am surrounded by coaches because this is what I do when I, you know, network with coaches and I have my own coach also. I catch it faster, but I still, I, these thoughts are still coming. And I, you know, a few weeks ago, I did slip back into burnout territory simply because I was thinking I need to do it all and I need to do it all by myself and it all has to happen right now and not taking the breath that I needed, even though I preach it to everyone, take your recovery breaks. I just got into that same mindset again. Luckily, now it takes me about a week to realize, uh oh, watch it and then take action right away so that obviously has changed now that I've had my burnout experience and that I'm a, a coach so you are sort of trained in dealing with these things um, but yeah I think being empowered and feeling that I have I can shape things I can create things for myself and others I can give value to others in the way that is good for me um, in terms of talking to them in terms of writing for others 
that is that is a beautiful thing and that i at the time i couldn't do that in academia i know other people can now especially there's more coaching but for me i could have not been able would have not been able to feel like that back then mm -hmm. and if you could say maybe one thing to to that nicole who was in the thick of it or in in burnout in those first four months maybe that didn't have the energy to get out of the house maybe even the bed sometimes what would you tell her well deep deep down i would tell her i think what probably everyone needs to hear which is you're safe you're good enough you're doing the best with what you know now and that is all you can do um and give yourself some self-compassion um no hard and harsh words needed you know um just trust that you will get out of it um and do it with a with a little sprinkle of self compassion and kindness to yourself because i that is the hardest thing i think to be kind to yourself yeah that that resonates a lot indeed mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, sharing all of these with me, with, with us, with the listeners today. It is uh, not the easiest thing to talk about, Bernard, but mm. because of our courage, your courage to come out and say these things, okay. this is how we will change things little by little. And uh, what a beautiful ending to to uh this story now you are doing this work that is feeding you in such a way bringing you all this connection basically the, the opposite feeling of what you had a few years ago yeah thank you and i will say it is um i felt in the past shameful about having had burnout and i wondered should i talk about it but I will say talking to you um, and talking to others or the listeners, there is a, it, it just really feels good to tell your story. Um, it is cathartic and also it makes you see yourself in a better way. So it's, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you about this. And by the way, having your support, because I, we've also been in contact while I had burnout and that has also been really healing. Um to receive your advice as well i'm so grateful for that and so happy thank you so much